right, great. Good morning, good afternoon to all of our participants today. So thank you for joining us in this segment. My name is Eric Zurich. I'm the Vice President for Red Raven, which is our IoT segment here in FlowServe. And I'm joined today by David Bria from Microsoft, who does digital rollouts and digital partnerships with folks like FlowServe and probably some of the, the folks that have dialed into our session this afternoon. So just a warm welcome to David, and maybe we'll start with a little bit of introduction, David, and then we can get into, I've got a bit of prepared questions, but then we can take it from there. Excellent. Well, thank you, Eric, and thanks for letting me be part of this. I think it's going to be a great discussion, both highlighting the partnership between FlowServe and Microsoft, along with maybe sharing some perspectives and insights based on our um, respective backgrounds. So just real quick on me, I'm part of the worldwide manufacturing team here at Microsoft. I get the pleasure of working with our most strategic customers on some of their transformation journeys. So we are doing a lot of work on the shop floor, as you can imagine, over the past uh, two years in the supply chain and even upstream into the supply base, as well as uh, product design, R&D simulation. Um, I've been at this for 36 years, I think this month. So started working in a plant in Flint, Michigan, three days out of high school. I paid for my double E degree doing that when they were still standing. So I've seen firsthand, you know, what happens when manufacturing leaves a community. And then since that time have uh, kind of bounced between consulting, doing strategy and delivery work, and then different uh, technology companies. So work with uh, SAP, probably, lo probably the longest up until when I joined Microsoft about three and a half years ago. Okay, fantastic. David, amazing experience because as I think about digitization and things like the automotive industry and how they pivoted through the different changes that they saw in their backgrounds and their history, uh, really an amazing time. And I think we see the same thing in the industrial segment. So FlowServe's Red Raven IoT solutions are really pointed towards those industrial customers, ones that are thinking about making a journey through digitization. I know with your career and 30 plus years in the industry, uh, you've probably seen it all. And so one of the questions I had for you, I wanted to ask, and I'm excited to kind of unpack some of these topics, but digitization, it's a huge topic, right? There's a lot of places to start. Obviously, Microsoft is a huge company, and there's a lot of places where they can probably help out clients. Um, but how do you first advise a company? It's a major undertaking to do a huge digital transformation. Uh, but for the industrial customers that are on the phone today and on the call, how do you think about approaching these challenges? It is, is it something that can be phased, or how does Microsoft first engage with its customers? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, like I said, I've been with the company for three years. Our engagement model with customers has changed quite a bit. I think um, as a technology leader, we've hopefully earned the right to talk about what's cool and what's coming in the future, but at the same time, every company is starting from a different point. And so rather than really talking about the vision, uh, as we all know, technology's had a lot of false promises on the shop floor over the past few decades. We're really trying to uncover and unlock new sources of value. So as we really understand the way that work gets done, there's a lot of paper-based processes. There's a lot of tribal knowledge in terms of how decisions are made. And there's a lot of process disconnects. So even though there's been I think a lot of advancement in, in terms of systems of record, things like MES, quality management capture systems, um, even ERP, there's still a lot of work that's being done based on gut instinct. And so mm -hmm. rather than trying to come in with a bunch of new bright ideas, I think we're really trying to focus on how we can help companies improve current operations, but also push them to think about what their business needs to look like to uh, respond to changes in the external world over the next three years or so. And so, you know, what's different is not really the ideas. I think what's different is the ability to deploy technology that's not um, out of the box. It, it's a lot more um, configurable and it can really enable a much quicker time to value at scale than ever before. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. That's one of the things that we heard with our customers. We used to have very, I would say, customized solutions, and it would take time to roll those out to the field. And I think what we heard from our customers is, can we move faster? Is there something that's IoT that's a lighter touch? How do we just get started? And so we had that same type of conversations with our clients. 
your background is so interesting to me because obviously double E background, uh, automotive, heavy industry, one of the heaviest and one of the oldest in, in North America, obviously. With your background in automotive, did you see that change happen in digitization? Is it still happening in the automotive segment? And, and if so, what lessons learned can be applied to things like the oil and gas space or chemical or petrochemical? How, how do you think about that? I mean, I think as I look at those industries, they've always been leaders in one way or another. They're very asset intensive. Um, the complexity around what you need to do to compete and do that at a global scale uh, really extends across any other industry. Um, mm -hmm. I think in automotive, I went from a model where you kind of designed and built where you sold vehicles. And so, you know, saw the way that the annual model release was what happened in different parts of the world to global supply chains where a lot of the um, not only assembly centers, but the component manufacturing operations, they all disappeared in the U.S. for the most part um, in, in the early to mid 90s. And so that created global supply chains. We saw the transition to uh, global vehicle architectures. So, well, um, <laughs> digital twins are not new. I was working on digital twin. In fact, wrote my thesis on that back in, um, I, I'm giving away my age, but the, the late 80s, early 90s, I, I think the, um, the ability to really do that in a way that <clears throat> encompasses the complexity and the dynamics. So you don't really have the ability to write code that takes six months and then be able to do one or two simulations. Um, the, the challenge, I think, with that speed, and I think that's really going to be a competitive weapon as we see these energies move forward, is how they're going to be able to create the right cash flow to invest in the future. So in automotive, you know, ICE engines are going to be around for a long time, um, but the future is EV. And so being able to figure out how you really run the, the existing operating model to invest in the future is a big challenge. I think late Sergio Marchione kind of talked about confessions of a capital junkie where Chrysler was investing their enterprise valuation every 12 to 18 months to keep up with the product development cycles. And so as we look at energy moving from fossil fuels to EV sources, I'm sorry, not EV, but green sources, um, looking at downstream oil and gas, and how they're really refining petroleum-based products into new and different types of additives and chemicals. It's still gonna be asset intensive, but the way mm -hmm. that things are going to define operational excellence mm -hmm. is going to change. I think that back to your original point, I don't see anybody really being able to go from zero to a hundred <laughs> in one fell swoop. So it's really a unique combination of trying to figure out how you put together the right capabilities so that you can create return. It's got to look different than an SAP implementation that might take five years and you keep your fingers crossed that good things happen when go live hits. Um, so this investment profile along with exit ramps. So how do you invest, do trials, and then double down on where things are working and you want to scale? Mm -hmm. So I want to unpack that a little bit because I think you're spot on with that, that reply. So are you saying then that there can be smaller investments made in digital? I think, in my opinion, you can do this in phases. You see the ROI from that. That allows you to return that back into the business and maybe gain the benefit of that. It's a lot different in my perspective than, like you said, the SAP or the, the large ERP implementations or CRM solutions and whatnot. I mean, generally, that's migrated towards web-based applications or cloud-based applications. But in your opinion, you know, what's different in the last, I would say, five or six years versus you know, 10 years ago in terms of applying digital and investing in digital solutions? Yeah, I think the biggest um, change that we've seen was really driven by a lot of the shutdowns as a result of the COVID pandemic. You know, companies were forced overnight to figure out how to work remotely in a lot of cases where people weren't allowed to show up or people couldn't show up because they were ill. And so it exposed a lot of weaknesses, both in terms of how work got done in the site and then across the value chain. Um, as we've kind of gotten through the worst of that and companies are getting back to a growth agenda, 
we're seeing some persistent changes. And so we've learned a lot from our customers, something as simple as Teams, or um, we call it the Power Platform, which is more than Power BI, but how they've really been able to enlist the support of the experts. And to me, the experts are the people on the front lines doing the work every day. <laughs> it's it's um, maybe a little bit of a challenge to IT departments to kind of capture that creativity and control it in a governed way. But at the same time, we're seeing a real explosion of not just companies, but the workers themselves trying to figure out smarter, more efficient, better ways of doing things. And so it, it becomes a challenge around the great resignation, around trying to attract new talent. Let's face it, people coming out of school don't have the same kind of mechanical skills as, as we did when we had to rebuild carburetors to do the lawn. <laughs> um, but they are digitally native and, and they're able to do a lot of different things. And so um, how do you really create roles where you can take advantage of that and, and frankly, keep people from doing work in dark, dirty, dangerous places? Because that's another big concern mm -hmm. around safety and and as we move forward, sustainability is becoming a, a big part of that as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I had this uh, genie out of the bottle moment when I was sitting at my kitchen table. So like everybody else probably on this call today, I had uh, you know, the experience of working from home for probably 18 months or so. And in the middle of that, we launched our Red Raven IoT platform. One of the big moments of a, you know an aha moment I had, I was sitting at my kitchen table and I was looking at some of the networking data coming in and I could see those live data streaming off these pumps in this customer facility that we were monitoring. And it just dawned on me, oh my gosh, I'm looking at live data coming off the pumps. We can do something about it. The customer's looking at the same data in real time. We could have jumped on a Teams call or, or a Zoom call like this and, and figured out how to collaborate. So I think that change, that transition, uh, you know, COVID accelerated that for us and we saw that. I think it disrupted you know, the supply chain and the markets and all these other things. So we're still riding through that mess. But coming out of that, I think these productivity tools that digital enables, it's, it's amazing to me. So that was my moment when I realized, aha, okay, I think we're onto something that there's been a pivot or a step change towards the adoption of digital technology. I think that'll roll through industry. So interesting. I wanted to ask, uh, one of the things that we learned in our lessons learned uh, was the value of partnerships. And so that's one of the things that we really enjoyed working with Microsoft on. You guys obviously help up stand up, you know, stand up our back end, uh, Microsoft Azure. It's a major component in how we deliver IoT to our customer base. Uh, that was an early decision we made that was strategic and said, we're going to focus on the things that we do well. So we do have, we have great algorithms, we have hazardous rated sensors, we have the uh, service and support for our customers. So when they sign up with Red Raven, we've got all these elements that we think we're good at, but we're not the architecture or the infrastructure experts. And so that's where we brought in somebody like Microsoft. So can you tell me a little bit how you guys think about partnerships, your step in the value chain, kind of where you think you, you add the most value and you can use flow service as an example or anybody else, but that you really helped us move much more quickly from concept to delivery. So can you expand on that? Yeah, I think credit goes to our CEO Satya in really taking more of an open approach to the way that Microsoft does business in general. Um, if you think about our products, the way that uh, the GitHub acquisition has brought a lot more people into the Microsoft community it really starts there. I think one of the um, changes in the culture is this concept of a learn it all. <laughs> so you still go to Redmond, there's a lot of know-it-alls, but at the same time, um, my role didn't exist before they hired me. They didn't hire me because I'm a double E or I knew how to program in Fortran, <laughs> but um, really for the industry depth. And so if you think about Microsoft's heritage, it was really around driving productivity with clerks and white collar positions, we see a huge opportunity to partner with experts like FlowSurf, right? Where you're the best in your market, you understand the details of the jobs that your customers are trying to do, and then move beyond a traditional kind of buy-sell relationship. I think where we have been able to deliver value that's recognized by our respective end customers, it's where we've been able to combine a value proposition that brings together the unique strengths of, of both parties. We've got a pretty formal process, so it doesn't happen by chance, right? Where we go from a sell to, to a build with, to a sell with. And that tends to be a natural progression, but 
Um, to me, what's most rewarding, and I think, uh, you know, to this day, uh, our partner ecosystem has really evolved from the traditional hardware, sensor, and system providers in operating environments. These are the companies that create the machines that create the OT data to digital natives, right? The companies that are building digital twins, digital grids, dig digital graphs, doing things that have never been done before um, and doing it with Microsoft. And so to me, the most gratifying feedback from customers is when we are in these partner type of cycles and the end customer comes back and says, wow, I never thought that was possible. And in one case, they said, I don't even know what badge you wear because the teams operate so seamlessly. Yeah. So, you know, my the way I, I kind of simplify it is where we're trying to literally take the role of general contractor off the hands of our customers, because they could probably do the same thing dealing with Microsoft or FlowServe or some of your partners indirectly. Um, but when we put that together up front, we can make things go a lot faster. We can de-risk it from them having to deal with their own teams and IT departments. And then we can really build from what the immediate need is to what the longer term opportunity could be. No, I appreciate that, David. I think my background, so you were a double E, I was a mechanical engineer. And so I spent most of my career in heavy gas turbines and pumps and motors and all the equipment that you see out on the field. And so for me, the last four or five years has been a journey in learning to work with companies like Microsoft. I never had that opportunity personally, you know, in terms of my career. And so just the way the Microsoft team kind of brought us through this journey uh, was really commendable. One of the examples that I talk about here, even internally was uh, the Microsoft account executive for us called me one day and said, I think you guys are spending too much money and here's why, right? We had too many virtual machines running. We had too many instances, a lot of data that was moving back and forth. And he said, I think we can simplify that for you and lower your bill, right? So how many vendors call you up and say, hey, I have a way to save you more money. So I think that was a really, you know, foresighted thought of developing a partnership. And I think that's important. And so I learned that of how do I apply that to my customers? So what can we do? Can we lower their costs? Can we help them spot an issue earlier with our IoT data? Can we get into their reducing their overall, you know, predictive maintenance or preventative maintenance bills? So that's where that culture of partnering and evolving towards a service culture is so important. And so thanks to the Microsoft team for that, because I think it, it shows that value of partnering and thinking about the long term versus, oh, I got the order or I got the PO. That's that's a very short term thing, especially in today's environment of all this turbulence of supply chain and the markets are very unpredictable at the moment. So. No, we appreciate that. So building on that, so I just mentioned today is obviously a great sea of change happening in the industry. So everybody's getting pinched on labor, on supply. How does it relate back to digital? Because digital, I think if you rewind the clock, maybe four or five years ago, IoT, at least in my environment, it was a nice to have, right? This is really cool technology. It's really neat. I can see data coming in from the field. But for me, I don't, I don't have to have it today. This is something that maybe it's in the future. So, but I would say, I think that's changing. I think the ability to be competitive in the marketplace, to be quick to react, to be able to get something back online as quickly as possible. In your perspective as Microsoft, you're helping many companies beyond FlowServe. How do you see that change from technology that's cool or a nice to have into, this is the way that we run our business? Yeah, I think that's a big change with Microsoft as well. We can bury you with a lot of demos and technology architecture sessions around the coolest thing that came out of our own R&D labs. But with manufacturers, again, um, it, it's hard to lead with vision and be credible. Um, I like to look for the leverage and the leverage really comes back to how can I help identify where there is an opportunity to improve uptime where I can improve yield, where I can reduce cost, where I can avoid safety type incidents. So those are the usual suspects inside of a plant, a refinery, a processing center. Those are not new. At the same time, there's a lot of hidden losses. And so it kind of goes back to that concept of operational excellence. When we actually walk the floor, we can walk the physical flow. I like to also understand the decision flow and then actually get into the way that the work gets done. And so there's a lot of hidden losses. There's a lot of um, 
professors that have written about this, whether they're Lean Six Sigma practitioners or total quality management practitioners. I think that's, that's where we can find a lot of low hanging fruit to be able to help improve operations. And then, like I said, being able to really unleash the creativity of the people that are doing the work is where you really find the breakthroughs. The other thing that I think we um, can help you with is we do get a chance to work across different industries. So I've spent a lot of time with pharmaceutical and med device companies, as you can imagine. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with food companies right now. So if you think about where the global value chains are pinched or being disrupted, <laughs> that's largely where they're looking for transformation. Most companies don't volunteer and say, hey, I'm ready. <laughs> it's usually an outside force, but that's where we can go in and I think um, help provide guidance, but at the same time, figure out what is that unique journey that makes sense for them. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that, Debbie. I, I think... I also think about Flowserve's 3D strategy. So you talked about a couple of these things about pharmaceutical and different types of customers. We're seeing great interest in IoT from water, from desalination, from food and beverage, uh, airport refueling centers. I, some of these customers I'd never approached before. I didn't think about them on an everyday basis, like some of our traditional oil and gas customers. And so I think it's helping the oil and gas folks decarbonize, get more efficiency, safety, productivity, and then where some of these new interests lie around uh, mobility of people, right? Transportation as a segment. I see a lot of capital flow into those markets. And so there's a lot of interest around digital. So it's interesting to see how the capital flows between the different markets and then who has the interest in, and uh, the fortitude to move forward really quickly with something like digital, which can be scary. But I think, like you said, you were talking about the boots on the ground or the people that are in the field that see those opportunities first, we see the same. And so there's applications out there that we didn't think of. And somebody comes back from the field and says, hey, what if we instrumented this piece of equipment or this is where the issue is? Let's look at that for uh, for an IoT solution. So I think having that very realistic approach is extremely important. So it's not just pie in the sky. It's very practical. And that's one of the things I think as a 200 plus year old company, FlowServe has the ability to to learn from that experience of a field service team. So that's really interesting. I just wanna, I'll close with uh, one question for you because this is kind of interesting. And I think we have some listeners out there today that are probably early career, maybe they're just out of college, they're looking at industry, but they're thinking about digital and how do I invest in my career skills? What advice do you have to the 20 somethings that are just coming out of their, their coursework and they're thinking about it's IoT or working for Microsoft or one of these industrial companies uh, what advice do you have to give for somebody like that? Well, ha having um, a son that just graduated college, <laughs> hopefully my counsel is uh, is relevant, but, you know, he just got out of school with a finance degree in as he was deciding to go out of state, which is more expensive, at least for those of us that live in Michigan. Uh, my, my guidance to him was, look, you know, go into areas that you have interest do what you can to learn about things that you don't know, but understand that the reason you're doing that is to gain perspective or skills that somebody's going to pay for. And so while mm -hmm. um, each one of us is kind of a creature of habit at the same time, I think the um, leaders of tomorrow are going to be people that can move beyond transaction processing. There's not going to be a need for people processing POs or payments, right? In the future, we're selling RPA and robots and things to take the take that kind of mechanical work out of the day-to-day -day processing. But there's always gonna be a need for people that can do complex problem solving, that can create a vision and get people to follow them. So, you know, project management across different disciplines is something that'll never be automated. I think the last thing is just around being able to have the insight to see what's coming and try and get in front of it, right? The people that are gonna be able to acquire experiences and develop the skills to do that are gonna be super um, in, in enlightened and empowered in the future. And so um, what a brave new world, right? What an opportunity to be a 20 something. Yeah, I, love it. I wish I was. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know. I wish I was too, but it is inspiring. So seeing these people come out of college, taking these tracks, and then for somebody like me or even yourself with the traditional core engineering degree, but 
midway through my career now I'm transitioning into this digital state and it's really refreshing because you get you're learning a whole new language and there's a whole new approach and I think a lot of our joint clients right it's a little bit intimidating to take that first step forward but for me it is a new way of doing business it's a new way of engaging with the equipment in the field or the field service personnel um, understanding what the data tells us it's really an exciting time and I think transformational in all the industries. So David, I wanna thank you for joining us today. I think it's really insightful. It's refreshing to hear from a partner like Microsoft, all the things that you guys are doing for your clients around the world. Uh, we're excited to partner with you all and just look forward to the future and what the next couple of years bring between the two companies. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll close the session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody who joined. Likewise, thank you.